Hello and welcome to a LiveG developer guide. Um, today we're going to be looking at a repository of ours called uh, OS Bootstrap and what it does is it builds LiveG OS uh, release images that, that people can use to install the OS to their own devices. Um, and today I'm going to be building uh, LiveG OS from scratch basically. Um, and then I'm going to be testing it out and I'll be showing you uh, some of the code behind the build pipeline as it were. Um, so first things first is we do have a readme uh, document which contains pretty much most of the information uh, that will be useful to you uh, if you want to build LiveGOS yourself. Um, it is worth noting at the time of recording that I am currently checked uh, checked out on a branch, um, which is multi-platform support, which is uh, we're hoping to merge into our main branch soon. But uh, by the time you probably watch this video, uh, it might have been merged. Uh, something to check later on. Um, so I'm going to go ahead and start. Uh, the build process uh, and the way I can do this is by using the dot slash uh, uh, bootstrap.sh command uh, from the directory OS bootstrap where you uh, cloned repo and you can also supply an optional argument um, if you look at the file uh, you can type in x86 underscore 64 uh, if you are trying to build for a modern uh, a typical PC that runs, uh, you know, your modern AMD or Intel CPU. Um, we'll also be providing extra uh, platforms, so you'll be able to type in PinePhone, for example, uh, to build for the PinePhone, um, uh, or Raspberry Pi, um, or even our own devices when uh, we have them available uh, to the public. So. I'm going to go ahead and just go x86.64, which is the default option if you weren't type, if you didn't type it in, um, and I press enter. So the first things first is that it downloads uh, a base ISO image uh, from the Debian uh, website, and it is basically our starting uh, system image that we'll be using to customize and we'll be adding our own uh, changes to it uh, automatically through these scripts here. So it's nearly done, it doesn't take too long, it's about 300 or 400 uh, megabytes and it will then start installing. Uh, this is something that happens entirely automatically um, as you can see. And it's going to go through and install the Debian packages uh, that you need for a bare bones system. Um, this does take a bit of time. As you can see, it's uh, doing all sorts of different processes, uh, which requires the internet um, as it downloads all these packages. When it's done, it will automatically move on to the next stage, um, which I'll be showing you in a bit. Um, this again does take a bit of time. As you can see, it's extracting all the different packages uh, once it's downloaded them, which it has now. Um, there aren't too many packages really compared to a beefed up Debian system that you'd use for daily usage. For instance, uh, the space system won't have X, uh, X windows, um, so you won't be able to do graphical things. We'll be installing that later uh, for our own customization scripts. Nearly done, although I think there is a stage after this one. Um, this is much quicker, by the way, if you have uh, KVM enabled with uh, Kimu, which is the emulator. Um, you can find out more information about that in the README. Um, 
of course here I'm building the OS on Linux uh, because that's our main supported platform. This is specifically Debian Linux. Um, so without uh, KVM it'll take about 30 odd minutes, 37 minutes, but with KVM it will only take 8 minutes so it's worth choosing that option especially if you're trying to rapidly prototype stuff. Um, and if you're using WSL, then there's some useful information about how to enable that in WSL. So considering that on Windows, WSL is essentially a container, so it does make life a bit more difficult. Um, this is the next stage that it's going through. Now, interestingly, um, this installation process is all automated on this bit um, using a pre-seed file. Now I'll, show, I'll be showing you that later uh, about how that works, but essentially it's providing all the options that you would otherwise have to manually enter, like time zones, uh, where you want to get your packages from, usernames, passwords, <clears throat> and all that. Uh, so this definitely makes it much more streamlined and we barely have to touch the system, really. It all just does it by itself. It should be uh, shutting down in a moment, although it's having to install the bootloader, which is quite useful for a computer to be able to boot. <laughs> and it's nearly done. Last step, of course, it's just unpackaging uh, some more packages. This process will be skipped, by the way, uh, if you run it again, so it won't take as long next time. Um, I'm going to enter my password here, and you don't normally need to enter your password uh, if you have a sudo uh, enabled with the no password option, which is recommended if you don't want to suddenly have to uh, enter your password midway through the building process. Um, that way it won't prompt your password um, and everything will be automated much nicer. So it's currently installing the libgos uh, specific packages and tweaks. This is going to take some time so what I'm going to do is I'm going to show you through some of the code stuff. As you can see it's uh, going to do the next bit which is all, again, automated, so I don't need to touch anything. Um, so we'll start at bootstrap.sh. So this is the command that we ran earlier, and it's still running um, as we continue. And basically, this bit um, t determines what platform you want to build for and stores that in a variable for the rest of the process to use. Um, we first call uh, server.sh from this script. Again, this is all modular, so each bit is split up. Uh, server.sh basically starts a Python process in the background, which runs a HTTP server. And that server hosts um, this folder, host, uh, slash whatever platform you're using. Uh, and that contains a bunch of files, which in fact, this process right here is gonna be uh, downloading um, it's essentially just a way of getting these files into the main system, um, which includes our customizations and tweaks and stuff. Um, so once it's started the server, the next step is, let me just try and find it, is get base.sh. So that was the step where we download the Debian base image and store it in our cache folder. So that file is here, base.iso. After that, uh, let's have a look. We go to boot.sh. So this is uh, booting the base image for the first time. This bit, if you haven't built before, will run. Uh, otherwise, it will just copy one that you built earlier from the cache. Uh, so for a start, it builds a system image, so this is not an ISO file, so it's not an installation image that is normally read-only. 
It's an image which is a bit like a hard drive in a computer. And that's what we are currently booted up, uh, up on right now. Um, so it creates one which is about 4 gigs in size, which is fine. It then uh, boots that, so we actually go to this step. Um, it boots the OS, which at this stage is the Debian base image, um, and it ran that setup thing, that blue screen that you saw earlier. Um, and the way it automates that is it runs boot keys dot sh, uh, which is this script, um, and it types in uh, the following keys to uh, that, that Debian boot uh, image which is send key escape, so it just presses the escape key when it uh, shows the grub menu. Then it types in this, which essentially, it basically calls uh, the pre-seed file, it loads the pre-seed file in so that we don't have to type in all those uh, manual setup stuff like the username and the password and everything. So that pre-seed file is at this IP address, which is the one which is our Python server is hosting. So preseed.cfg is right here in the host and then the platform directory. This is the preseed file. So it contains uh, a bunch of changes, of which we've still got uh, some stuff to remove. Clearly, there's a lot of commented stuff uh, from the example that Debian gives us. Um, but it sets things uh, such as the locale to uh, English, although this can be changed later on. Uh, by the user when we've built the system, uh, the keyboard layout, uh, the network interface, which we just leave as auto because then it chooses uh, the bridge between Kimu and the host system. Uh, we don't give it a host name and domain at this point. At this point, uh, we've got country, we've got uh, root details. Um, this is where we define the system user uh, on Lifty OS, um, which calls G shell, and the password, which is uh, the super secure LiveG, although this can be changed later on um, in our later processes, um, as well as time zones and uh, file system setup, partitioning, and all that. So we don't have to touch the system, it just does it all for us, which is nice. So it's called that. It started the system, and once the system shuts down, as it did earlier, after uh, configuring the base installation, it then copies the uh, system to a cache. So base uh, install.image uh, is a cached version of the system.image uh, file, which we're working on. So we don't have to go through that uh, blue screen setup process again, <coughs> which is nice. Next, uh, we copy G shell, uh, the app image for G shell, uh, to our host folder so that we can download it in the in the OS. This stage here uh, itself. So we have to supply G shell uh, at the location cache slash the platform slash G shell dot app image. So it's uh, I believe it is this file here, although it should actually really be in there, um, so I'll move that. But it'll get copied to this uh, folder here, in any case. Um, it looks like uh, we can actually go back to our live demo right now. So right now it's actually creating an ISO file, which I'll talk about in a bit. Um, and you'll see that we now are booting a copy of LiveG OS as an ISO. So uh, uh, here we go. And as you'll be able to see, we can go through the whole setup process and configure keyboard layout, you can install LiveG OS and so on. Um, this is exactly the same uh, process as you'll be able to see when you download LiveG OS from our website. So I'll close that. Um, so the script is now finished. But going back to uh, showing the code, um, again, we, we copied G shell to the host folder. Um, 
we mount the disk image so we can add in some files um, from our base install uh, with our customizations on top. Um, so that involves setting the auto login so we don't have to uh, log in manually. Um, it copies the first boot script over, which I'll show you in, in a moment, and it executes it um, when the system starts. It changes things like the host name, uh, the OS names, and the OS details, and all that lovely stuff um, before running the system. At this point, it runs the system and the system runs the first boot script. So this is not run by the host. This is run in Kimu by the by our system. So this shows lived GOS bootstrapping. That's a bit of ASCII art which has to be escaped uh, because it's in Bash. Um, so at this stage, it uh, changes the host name uh, in the host file. Then it does some system directory changes, so it sets our user directory to slash system rather than home system, which is not as desirable in our use case. Um, we then check uh, if we want to install dependencies. This can be optionally skipped if you want to develop stuff, but we normally keep that uh, enabled so we can do the thing from start to finish. So at this stage, it updates uh, apt and installs a few required things uh, for us to enable the LiveG apt repository. So the LiveG apt repository, I'll be able to show you, is this. It's hosted on uh, our site as well here, um, opensource.livg.tech slash livg-apt. Um, and it, con it basically can contain packages which we will find useful uh, to include in our system but are are not necessarily on the Debian uh, package repository yet. So for example uh, with the Pine phone uh, we'll need some packages from Mobian uh, but Mobian is not Debian um, so we're going to have to port some of those packages from Mobian into our own package repository because Debian doesn't have them. So that includes the kernel for the Sun Xi uh, CPU architecture, uh, as I think it's called, for the all-winner A64 in the Pine phone. Um, and that's required so that we can actually run uh, the system <laughs> and uh, associated firmware. Um, so that's why LiveG's apt repository is required. So that basically installs uh, well, it adds the app repository to our system. And then it installs a bunch of uh, dependencies, uh, so X11, um, X Windows rather, uh, Chromium stuff, and all that, so that we can then install Electron. It then downloads G Shell, and that's that app image from this point in our host. Uh, folder, so that's being served, and we're downloading it at that IP address again, which our Kimu guest can access, and it stores it in slash system slash bin slash gshell .app image. so it's in our user folder. It makes it executable, of course. Um, then down downloads other gshell specific stuff, so our device uh, description files, so more information is available about that on docs.livg.tech and that's in gshell then device description file that contains information there alternatively you could just search ddf or device description file rather and you'll be able to find it there so that's uh, something to bear in mind um, we then continue adding some startup scripts which are stored, I believe, in the host folder. So we've got startup.sh, uh, which will um, set some user permissions, which you have to set. Uh, I think that's applicable to the ISO specifically. Um, they then have a check to see if we're running already in X11. Um, I think that was just for debugging purposes. 
then we start up uh, X with Xlodosh, uh, SH, <laughs> um, and that runs G-Shell, of course, and those are files which are added at, first boot, uh, at the first boot process, so they're not run at the first boot process, they're only added in for later, and when it is later, <laughs> when we boot up the next time, uh, we run startup.sh uh, immediately instead of first boot. Uh, so we only run first boot once, of course. Um, hence the name. We then uh, add some files which are needed uh, during installation. So at that stage where on the OS you are uh, choosing your drive to install to, uh, and then you click continue. Um, these are the files which are used uh, to install into the live system. Um, so that includes our grub file, like this, um, which is libgeos. So when you start it, it will say starting libgeos. Um, as well as fs tab. So fs tab contains information about uh, where to mount. G OS um, and that kind of stuff, and FS tab uh, swap. So it's the same, uh, but for cases where you may have swap uh, memory available, uh, virtual memory, as it were, which is applicable at a certain threshold for the amount uh, of storage that you're giving with GOS. Um, again, we write uh, <coughs> the startup script. I don't know why we do it again. Um, probably not necessary <laughs> and then we clean up some stuff so we actually uh, set the auto login stuff I think we revert it from a previous stage so it's just cleaning up stuff and we remove uh, the first boot script from our bash RC and we can shut down so we then shut down and we then continue so I believe we are back at boot we then remove the cached version of system.image and return back to the bootstrap script and the next stage is making the ISO file. Now this won't be applicable for building for Pine phones and uh, Raspberry Pis because you're basically putting the image directly onto your target storage device when you're uh, preparing for these devices. So. ISOs are mainly just for PCs and that kind of thing. So the ISO, uh, which is basically, again, it's our storage um, that you'd normally burn onto like a DVD drive uh, or a USB stick, uh, more commonly these days, uh, so that you can copy lift your OS to uh, your tar target drive, which is normally internal storage. Um, but during the ISO process, um, we make a backup, of course. Backing up is kind of handy, uh, caching stuff for later. Um, I believe we then mount the system image to the root file system, which is normally, uh, like last time, it's in a root FS file, uh, folder in the build directory. We copy the ISO version of Grub, so we need a different version for our setup process for each of these files, um, as you'll see in the FS tab, it's much more different um, because we've got a CD-ROM involved, regardless if you're if you're using a USB, I believe. It also sets up like temporary file systems and that kind of thing, which is needed because it's only a uh, live environment which is read-only, so we need temporary storage to be able to do stuff. Um, we also need to copy init overlay.sh. So this, as I just mentioned a, a moment ago, um, that temporary file system is handy uh, for being able to enable write access onto an otherwise read-only system. And this process allows us to write in all directories, not just the temp directory, um, by applying an overlay. So once this runs, we'll be able to write everywhere, even though it's temporary, of course. Um, it's, it allows us to dump files 
during the installation process. Um, so it adds in your lower, upper overlay kind of folders. So our lower is read only and our overlay is read write, read write. So that's handy. Once that's done, we then make a uh, ISO itself, uh, which is this grub make rescue command. And what it does is it gives a it passes the output ISO image path um, and then the input root file system that we'll need uh, to turn into an ISO. So we still got that mounted here. Don't forget. It then passes a directory pointing to grub uh, because this is the grub command. So we need grub to be able to boot the system. Um, we give it a volume name, so libgeos im for installation media. That's required so it can identify the volume because we don't use UUIDs because they change depending on what device you burn the ISO onto. We also uh, give some permissions to uh, sudo so we can actually run it, uh, otherwise it's impossible to run sudo in the ISO environment um, for some reason. <laughs> Um, and we also uh, make the init overlay script um, executable um, so we can actually run it later on. Um, so that, that user sbin init overlay script is copied um, to this location from the init overlay.sh file there. So it becomes a, a system executable, as it were. Now at this point, um, we haven't removed it yet. That's mainly just for testing purposes. You saw at the end of uh, running that script that we started up the live ISO environment um, just to see the libg OS out of box system run, uh, setup system running. So that's something which we'll be removing for automation purposes soon, but it will still be there possibly behind like an argument that you can supply to possibly uh, bootstrap.sh. So that's the whole system done. Uh, uh, just to remind you of a brief overview, we start um, by starting the server so we can access the host uh, folder contents from the guest, uh, the guest Kimu emulated system itself. Um, we then get the base ISO image, uh, which is Debian, um, so that we can then customize it. And the next stage in that, in the boot script, is to uh, initially set it up um, before, with some automations um, before it shuts down. Um, then we mount it, we add some stuff, uh, we unmount it again um, at this location here uh, and then we boot up our newly set up system um, and we run first boot um, which adds in a bunch of extra customizations which are only possible when the system is running and then back to bootstrap we then optionally this only applies to some pro uh, platforms remember uh, make the ISO file and that involves also copying a bunch of stuff um, into the system to make it bootable, uh, building the ISO file itself and running it with a test uh, hard drive just to see if it works and luckily for us it does <laughs> um, and that ISO file uh, so that ISO file is system.iso in the build and then your platform directory is here. Um, and that is the one which gets distributed onto our website and other things. So that's the one which you can actually use as the installation copy. So that's good. I think that's about it really in terms of um, all the details. Um, I'll be looking forward to be adding extra platforms because right now it only supports x86 64 processors um, 
we'll be adding things like ARM64 on there um, and all those other platforms, which will be fun. Um, can't wait uh, for us to do that, actually. It'll be exciting to see it running on Pine phones properly and also Raspberry Pis. Um, so that's coming soon. But now you've been oriented with the system, you can uh, try building it yourself. And if you've got any questions or you need some help, you can find us on Discord. Um, you can find the Discord link at the bottom of the LiftG website, liftg.tech. Um, there's also the GitHub repository for this, don't forget. So github.com slash liftgtech slash OS bootstrap, which is hit. And that's all the code you just saw. And if you've got any issues, put them there, of which we've got one, or any pull requests, which is the one that I'm working on right now. And we'll respond, we'll happily respond. So that's about it. Thanks for watching. Um, I hope you uh, have learned quite a few things about how LiveG uh, does stuff uh, with its OS. Um, and I'll see you soon. Goodbye.